Hi, welcome back to my channel and for today's video for the complex analysis series, we will be talking about the limits of functions of complex variables. So for those who had been here for a very long time, thank you so much for your undying support. And um, thank you for um, all your suggestive comments. And um, I just want to let you know that I am so grateful that you've been watching this for a very long time. Thank you also for um, the uh, peer review from my friend from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, Rodolfo Maza. And um, I just want to let you know that I just want to make sure that the video I'll be producing in my channel will be um, peer reviewed so that we can ensure the quality of the video that we are going to discuss as a help for these online um, classes. Okay, so we'll start with the definition of limits of functions of complex variables. So let a function f be defined at all points z in some deleted neighborhood at, of z sub 0. And um, we say that the limit of f of z as your z approaches z sub 0 is the number w sub 0 and this w sub 0 is an element of the set of complex numbers and we denote this symbol the limit of f of z as z approaches z sub 0 is w sub 0 is the point so that is um w equals f of z that can be made arbitrarily close to w sub 0 if we chose the point z close enough to z sub 0 but distinct from it so meaning to say that we're making this z uh, close enough to z sub 0 but we have to make sure that your z is distinct from z sub 0 so let's denote this um, thing here as equation 1 so if you notice I already have video um, uploaded before about limits of functions. However, the functions that we're dealing in that is actually the real function. So that means functions of real variables. In this video, this is actually an analog in the sense that uh, we're dealing with limits, but the function we're dealing here is functions of complex variables. Equation 1 simply tells us that um, for every epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta that's greater than 0 such that the absolute value of f of z minus w sub 0 is less than epsilon. Whenever this interval holds the absolute value of z minus z sub 0, however, its positive shall be less than the delta. So we la label this by equation 2. Okay, so what does it conveys? Um, geometrically, when we say that um, uh, on this equation 2, it says here that for every epsilon neighborhood of um, w sub 0, and we denote that by this w minus w sub 0 is less than epsilon, there exists a deleted, a delta deleted neighborhood or, or deleted delta neighborhood of z sub 0. And uh, from that delta um, neighborhood, we have this z minus z sub 0 less than delta, such that every point z in it has an image w lying in the epsilon neighborhood that's it so how do we show this geometrically okay um this means to say that uh let's say we have x we have y here and then um let's say we have a point here uh z so there is an z sub zero here you can find such that this is within the circle having radius delta okay so this is our origin here in such a way that you can have a mapping here that's let's say this is u this is your v 
So if you have a point um, W sub 0 here, and then um, you have a radius epsilon, so you can find a point W within the circle having radius epsilon. That's the message of the definition. But uh, you have to take note that even though all points in the deleted neighborhood, um, that's um, you have these uh, z minus z sub zero less than delta. So this is always positive. So although we have to be con uh, to, to consider that their images need not fill up the entire z plane. Now. Um, what if the limit of f of z as z approaches z sub 0 is equal to w sub 0 and at the same time, the limit of f of z as z approaches z sub 0 is also w sub 1. Okay, then um, so that means uh, you can find two points as limits of this f of z as z approaches z sub zero. So how do um what happened if that's the case? So what does it simply tells? Then for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta sub zero greater than zero and delta sub one greater than zero. Why? Because according to the definition, if you have this one here as the limit, then you have a corresponding delta sub zero greater than zero and with this one you have a corresponding delta sub one greater than zero such that these corresponding deltas can have this statement here f sub z minus w sub zero less than epsilon whenever um, this interval holds that's z minus z sub zero however it's positive shall be less than delta sub zero and this is Okay, so this is actually for the corresponding delta sub zero. How about for the delta sub one? So you have f of z minus w sub one. So that's the absolute value is less than epsilon. And whenever this interval holds, z minus z sub zero is less than delta one. Now, um, if we take this one here, so if we take another delta, let's say we take delta, that's delta is greater than the absolute value of z minus z sub zero. However, that's positive. So your delta shall be greater than zero. And um, in this case, your delta is less than delta sub zero and um, your delta is less than delta sub one. Okay, so we find, so we will find this case here. What happened to our absolute value of w1 minus w sub 0. So observe that I can have fz minus w sub 0 minus f of z minus w1. If you try to simplify this, you're actually going back to here. So I only add f of z minus f of z. So that means I simply add 0 on it. Now, um, if you notice, this is uh, less than or equal to, of course, f of z minus w sub 0 plus f of z minus w sub 1. Okay, and um, this is less than epsilon. And um, this thing here also is less than epsilon, so you'll get two epsilons. Okay, according to what we presented here. But um, if you notice, the absolute value of w1 minus w sub 0 is not negative and your epsilon can be chosen, chosen arbitrarily. This implies that our w1 minus w sub 0 is 0. And so our w1 is equal to w2. So from the start of this discussion, we assume that the W1 is the limit of f of z as z approaches z sub 0. And at the same time, the W sub 0 is also the same limit. So, but we end up having equal for a W1 and W2. 
So, the moral of this discussion says that the limit of the function is unique. So, the limit of the function is unique. That's it. Okay, so let's consider this example here. So, if f of z equals i z bar over 2 in the open disk, so your open disk here is the modulo of z less than 1, then um, the limit of f of z as z approaches 1 is i over 2. So we will show why is that the limit. Um, observe that um, the point 1 being on the boundary of the domain of the definition of function. Observe that when um, z is in the disk, so that means uh, it's in the disk, which is here, then um, f of z minus i um, 2 is actually i z bar over 2 minus i over 2. And simply this is actually the modulo of z minus 1 over 2. If I'm gonna simplify this thing here. So, what does it me mean? For every z and um, your positive epsilon, um, the absolute value of f of z minus i over 2 is less than epsilon whenever 0 is less than z minus 1 and it's less than 2 epsilon. So, which means to say that the condition is satisfied by points in the region um, modulo of z less than 1 when the delta, so that means you assume this to be your delta equal to 2 epsilons or any smaller positive number. So therefore, we've proven the claim that the um, limit of f of z as z approaches 1 in the open disk is i over 2. That's it. So uh, let's consider this for example. If our f of z equals z over z bar, the limit of f of z as z co converges 0 or approaches 0 does not exist. Okay, why it does not exist? Well, if it, um, if it did exist, then it could be found by letting the point z equals x, y approach the origin in any manner. So, um, why? If I'm going to check z equals x sub 0, so that means I work on the real axis, so the positive real axis. So that means um, this is our... Um, complex plane here. So this is our um, real axis. This one here is our imaginary axis. So I, 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 I will take points here on the real axis. So that means um, y is 0. <laughs> so if I take z equals x, of z, x 0, then f of z is x plus i 0 over x minus i zero so that means this is my z and this is my z bar and this is actually equal to one but if i take points on the imaginary axis so non-zero points on the imaginary axis so that means the real axis the real uh value is zero so that's zero y f of z is equal to 0 plus I Z, um, iy over 0 minus iy. So that's equal to negative 1. So if you notice, they're not equal. So that means um, this one thing here approaches 1. However, this one thing here approaches negative 1. So therefore, the limit does not exist. That's it. Okay, so that's all for now for the basic introduction for limits of functions of complex variables. So we will continue with this um, complex analysis series. So if you have any questions or clarification, please let me know so that um, we can discuss that. And thank you so much for watching, guys, and have a great day to you.
Bye for now.